Chris Galser here with Matt Howell. And it's our anniversary show. It's episode 299. Wow. One away from 300. And really, you celebrate the ones before because usually everything's downhill after that. You know, we're still trying to rope up uh, uh, some of the old hosts. Esposito uh, said he's in and he's excited about it. Um, Dave, as usual, in the wind. Nobody knows. No one's spoken to him. Nobody's connected with <laughs> him. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be here or not. At this point, I wouldn't count on it, unfortunately. I'd love to hear from him. But uh, anyway, that's more for uh, next time we get together. Matt, this week we talk, we're going to talk about The Witch, a rare opportunity for you to get out to the theater and see a film. So I'm excited about that. We're also going to continue our marathon of going back into the past and seeing all the films that we loved as kids and seeing if they still hold up. And this week... There's no seven degrees or six degrees. We're just starting at number one, Kevin Bacon <laughs> in Footloose. And then Matt had a great idea for a top five. And this is going to be our, I don't know, how do you want to, I think I may have fumbled it when I came, when I started doing it, Matt. But basically, okay. this is my greatest disparaging, you know, my, what exactly? I don't even remember now what the heck I called it. But it's basically um, in regards to the cinema score. So it's the top five cinema score disconnects is how I had it. So when you compare it to how critics liked it to, uh, the actual cinema score. And I basically actually just went with me. So everything that I disagree, <laughs> you know, the ones that I, I was very upset about. And there's some stuff in here that I'm really going to get worked up over. So I'm really excited about that. So uh, first up, though, let's hear a little bit from The Witch. You are wicked. Does he really speak to thee? This wilderness will not consume us. Who's there? You've cursed this family. This is witchcraft. (laughs) She placed a curse on me. Why have you turned against me? I saw it. Your reign of evil. It's not safe. Not with them. Think how my sins. Matt the Witch. So this film has got a, pr- a lot of buzz. And can I say something too? Uh, I'm not as from there's the film studio A24, right? They're the ones that released The Witch. And I think they're relatively new. But I got to tell you, they have had a great run of films. Uh, I, th- I like Spring Breakers, uh, mm. Under the Skin, Lock, mm. Obvious Child, The Rover. Um, well, Tusk is on there. <laughs> I've seen maybe I've seen a couple of those, but I mean the ones I've seen I've been really impressed with. I didn't realize they had done all those. A most violent year, Ex Machina. Mm. We talked mm. about Slow West on the show. Room. I mm. mean they've they've had a great run in just a couple of years. They've just started doing films in 2013. Wow. So this time they bring us The Witch. Now Matt, why don't you break it down? I've already talked entirely too much for some people. Why don't you describe The Witch to the folks at home? Uh, essentially, this is. Star is the story of a uh, Puritan family um, who is living in a New England colony. I don't think they ever really say where, but I'm assuming it's somewhere in Massachusetts in the 1600s. Um, the father uh, is banished and he takes the family out into the wilderness where they uh, kind of hack out a living and then come into contact with a witch. And I don't think it's anything. I, and, I, and one of the things that we will get into, but. I'm not spoiling by anything by saying they run into a witch because uh, there's no doubt about the supernatural aspects of this uh, film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would agree. And it is titled The Witch. But I guess I could see your point that maybe it's it's going to play on more paranoia mm-hmm. than actually being a supernatural bad guy. Right. But, the, but uh, you're right. They're in there. So we got The Witch. I'm curious, Matt. 
the reviews of this have been really good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Rotten Tomatoes, I think it was sitting at 93% the last time I looked at it. Yeah. And uh, 89 dropped a little bit. But I have some friends of mine who are big horror fans, and I was, I was on Facebook checking out what they thought, and some of them really hated it. Mm. They said it was a waste of time, and it was just, it was the big reveal was dumb, and they couldn't stand it. And I got to tell you, I couldn't have been farther away from those people. You know, I, 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 I really, really enjoyed this. I thought this film did a fantastic job of really just ratcheting up the creep factor, right? As if mm -hmm. it just, there's just, it's just permeating feeling of dread that just saturates this entire film, you know? And, and, and I think part of the success of that is how authentic it feels. And I don't know if that's what, with the addition of the fact that they use the old English when they talk. I got to admit, there's a couple of times I was wishing there were subtitles that I, <laughs> I had trouble following my own native language. But um, still, I, I I don't know, man. It's there's, it's kind of like comedies, right? There's two ways you look at comedies. The, the core principle, does it make you laugh? Um, the same thing with horror. Did this one make you, Was it? did it make you scared? Were you uneasy? And I got to tell you, man, I was throughout this entire thing. Do you agree with me? I 100% agree with you. I think, uh, and I think that was kind of one of the things that brought up the inventory is that, you know, I had seen the Rotten Tomatoes. I think it was over 90 the last time I saw it too. And um, but the 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 exit the exit scores or the audience scores were like in the low 50s, and I was I was baffled by this. Um, C minus you know, I, right now. C minus, C minus on yeah. Cinema Score. Yeah. So um, you know, I guess it's it's it, it may have something to do with. Uh, a difference of expectation, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, the way they shot this, um, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, the performances are outstanding, um, pretty much across the board. Um, I mean, Ralph Innocent as the patriarch is fantastic. Um, I was trying to place him too, and I couldn't remember who he was, and then it hit me halfway through. He yeah, Chris Finch for me in the BBC version of The Office. There you go. That's how I know him. It was that was a weird thing. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and um, you know, I, I it, there are there a lot of jump scares? No, but I mean, and is it? But this Thankfully. film has, yeah, yeah. I mean, this thing has a, this film has a like a creeping sense of dread that just kind of builds. And I, and I, honestly, there were scenes where I was absolutely, actually, truly horrified by what they were saying, and it, and it kind of stuck with me. I was thinking about this movie for a couple of days afterwards, just kind of like going over everything in my head. And um, yeah, it was it was absolutely great. Yeah, and it's it has it's a bit of a slow burn. It kind of starts off really good, and then there's kind of some stuff that unfolds. You're like, holy crap, you know. But then things kind of the scares kind of slow down a little bit, mm -hmm. and then it slowly starts ramping up again. You know, for me, for me, it was kind of reminiscent of House of the House of the Devil, yeah, um, which is a film I think we both really liked. Yeah, uh, but it was that kind of burn to it, you know, where and it just you just feel horrible as the film progresses. <laughs> and I love the use of the chorus, you know, the score for the film, and the use yeah. of the ah, uh, it, it just I, there's a few times where my the, the hairs in my arms were on end. You know, it was it's. Yeah, it's and another thing too that I thought was really good is not just in music, but the sound design in this film too is very good. It's very strong, and it really, it really brings you and puts you in there. You've, I really felt at times that I was like part of this family when everything is going so horribly, horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and I, I think one of the key things too, where it does walk the line a little bit for me of religious paranoia, you mm -hmm. know, and, and an absolute true horror. And how the kind of two just meld together, you know, you really get a feel for what it was like with the Salem witch hysteria, even though right. that wasn't really that was kind of a blown up thing, right? It was never as big as we always thought it was growing up, um, mm -hmm. but you really get a feel for what that must what it was like at that time. And uh, right. yeah, like, yeah, like you said, it just there are some true moments. In, there are from this moments in this film where I was. I was really, really scared, <laughs> waiting to see what was going to happen next. Yeah. And I, I so much want to talk about the ending, I know. Um, but I, we can't. I mean, we can talk about it offline because I don't want to ruin it for everybody. But when the big reveal hits, man, I almost jumped out. Of, I was like, Whoa! you I know, know, I was really just, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, man. When that uh, when that final scene, and I think you know, um, well, not the final scene, but not kind the of the thing scene. leading up to this. Yeah, mm -hmm. but. Um, 
when that happened, I got a chill in the movie theater. Like I was creeped out when down that to my bones. Mm-hmm. I did. Yeah. Yes, that was creepy as all get out. And it didn't help that it was like. I was watching this late at night and in the Hartford movie theater and I was literally the only person in there. So I'm in this <laughs> big dark theater by myself watching this thing. So yeah, it was, it was absolutely, it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, and I, and it really kind of disappointed that uh, horror fans are not really enjoying it, but it would also, what I do appreciate though is um, it did pretty well at the box office. I mean, all things considered to its budget and everything else. So, yeah. you know, maybe, yeah. maybe uh, we'll start seeing maybe more films like this, but we'll see. I hope so. Yeah, that, that's. Oh, I'm, I'm even thinking about it now. It's making me feel uneasy. <laughs> I think what, what seems like I, I, you kind of expect it to happen. Yeah. And then there's the. And then anyway, all right. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so if you've got a chance to see The Witch, we'd love to hear your thoughts. I know we kind of danced around a lot of it, but if you like horror films and you don't mind the pacing of something like that, and you're not you're not a jump scare saw kind of guy, if that's who you are, this is not your film. But if you're a more of a House of the Devil type fan, I think this one's going to pay huge dividends for you. So, uh, uh, and I would say, if you get go see it in the theater, I don't think you should wait to see this. I really thought it was that effective and that good. What would you would you tell them to the same thing, Matt? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, seeing it in a dark theater um, really sets the mood, and I think it's uh, even just the visuals of it. I think it's just great on the big screen. So I definitely think it's worth checking out. There you go. Shoot us an email at feedback at thefirstrun.com and share your thoughts. All right, Matt, let's uh, transition over then to the Blu-ray DVD picks. This is coming up this upcoming Tuesday, March 8th. First off, a little uh, uh, props now. I can't continue my record of fantastic Oscar picks because I never got around to doing the whole sheet. Mm. That's what happens when you, you're getting married and things go crazy. <laughs> um, but briefly, Matt, let's talk a little bit about it, okay? Um, first off, we'll start with actor in a supporting role, which I think is absolutely a travesty. I uh, listen. I saw Bridge of Spies, and Mark Rylance is—he's fine in it. He's great, but I don't think it was Oscar worthy, and especially with right. Stallone and Creed, it, that, it just seemed like that was a no, almost as much a no-brainer as any Morricone winning Best Score. And right. no, I don't know what it is. If they just if they're, if they're still upset with Stallone because he said he made stop my grandma, my mom will shoot or whatever it was. <laughs> but that one really bothered me. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't really know what that uh, how that happened. I mean, and it's not even like it's just such a, an odd pick for a win. I mean, it's not like any of the other guys where you could say, okay, I disagree, but I guess I could see why somebody could do that. This is like the epitome of like your bland Oscar pick, and nobody's gonna remember it, you know, in by six months from now at all. Exactly. And if Stallone didn't win, why did not Tom Hardy get it for the re- – I just – I can't understand it. Yeah. Uh, uh, best Supporting Actress. This one surprised me. Uh, Alicia Vikander for um, uh, the Danish girl one. I thought mm-hmm. it was going to be uh, – I was hoping it was going to be more ex machina that she'd win for. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I hadn't seen the Danish girl, so I can't really speak to that. But I just, I just saw Steve Jobs. That's why I went with Kate Winslet. Okay. Uh, actress in a leading role. Hey, I called that one, and I went. I changed my mind. Right, originally I was going Saroy Shonen in Brooklyn, and I said, you know, what? I'm going to go with my heart. Listen, we've been pushing Brie Larson on this show for years, and mm. we're I'm very excited that she's finally won an Oscar. Finally, so, but she's that she's yeah. won an Oscar, <laughs> and well deserved. If you haven't seen Room, uh, you absolutely have to. It is heartbreaking, life affirming. You'll be. It is absolutely a fantastic film. So you definitely need to see Room. I think it's available now, actually. Streaming and then uh, oh really to buy yeah I think it's on iTunes right now okay actor in a leading role uh, well he's got it now finally maybe he'll get a date Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> won his Oscar after all of that so all those tired Leo memes can be put to bed uh, best picture this is a this is a conscious pause. Well, you did, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't say director. You didn't say director. Oh, so we want to do director first? Yeah, All I right. think so. That's fine. I just was getting ramped up because of Best Picture. But fine, we'll talk about the director. And congratulations, Inarati, Ren. It's two wins in a row. Do you know how rare that is it's for to win two years in a row? He won last uh, year like, for Birdman and this year for Revenant. It's, it's a once in six decade plus occurrence, right? There you go. And so congratulations to him. I think well-deserved. Uh, if anybody should have beat him out, I would have said it would be George Miller. 
And we'll talk about what happened to Mad Max. So let's just jump into a map best picture. I don't understand this. Mm -hmm. I chose Revenant to win. I wanted Fury Road to win. And, out, and then we get Spotlight, possibly one of the weaker films out of the entire list. Is it yeah. good? Yes, it's good. But it's not great. And from what I understand, I was reading about this. I guess how it is is everybody votes, right? And then it, it's like this Heisman, or I guess how many how many first place votes you get, how many second place votes you get, and whoever gotcha. kind of has the plurality or the most votes in all the categories gets elevated, and other films get gets eliminated, and they vote again until they keep limiting it down until they find out what the best picture is. And I think what it is is enough people either loved or just thought Spotlight was okay mm -hmm. that it beat out Mad Max and Revenant. Or even The Martian, or Room. I mean, all these other films I feel are better movies, right? So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, this is again one of those years I think, which happens all too often with the Oscars, which is why I don't put a lot of stock in them. Where, you know, a, a movie, you know, you've got films that are nominated along with it that are going to be have, you know, lives for years and decades from here. People are still going to be talking about them and watching them, and guess what? Spotlight is not going to be one of them. I doubt in a year's time, nobody's going to be watching this thing. Yeah, no, it's just, it's another Shakespeare in love, but really, I think it is. So not that I don't think these films are Pulp Fiction worthy, but I don't, you know what? I can make an argument probably for Fury Road for what it did and what it was. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, in the long run, if you look at the whole thing, Fury Road really was a big winner last on the Oscars. They won the most awards. Yeah, now they're all almost what technical, but still yeah, pretty much. They won the majority of the Oscars, so, uh, the Academy Awards. So, good on them. Which know. doesn't make any sense. Which doesn't make any sense. Your no. movie is the best at everything about being movies, except for the things that you know. Everything else. Another one thing I don't understand too is how a one film can win Best Picture, but that director doesn't win. I never understand. Yeah, no. the, the, film, the film just directs itself. <laughs> it's when you take it as a whole. You take it as a whole, it goes together. Whatever. But I mean, when Spotlight winning, we did get to see uh, Michael Keaton's victory celebration, so that was something. If you there haven't you seen go. that gif, if you haven't seen that gif, that's a good one. Uh, I, you know what? I haven't. I have to check that out. Okay. It bothers. Uh, it still bothers me about last year. Damn you, Redmayne! All right, so come actually coming out on blue. Let's get back on course, Matt. Uh, Mac Macbeth, Michael Fassbender, Marion Cotillard. Their version of Macbeth is being released. From what I understand, it's it's okay, but the the most violent version of Macbeth to date uh, mm. includes a Blu-ray ultraviolet stream, a Q and A with Fassbender as well. The Forbidden Room. Now, you remember, <laughs> you remember when I made you guys watch um, My Winnipeg? Yes, God, I yes. loved my Winnipeg. <laughs> anyway, the latest film from Guy Mad in the Forbidden Room is being released. It's a submarine crew, a feared pack of forest bandits, a famous surgeon, and a battalion of child soldiers all get more than they bargain for as they wend their way through progressive ideas on love and life. I have absolutely no idea what this is about, but I definitely want to see it. It's, it's called an ultimate epic phantasmagoria. Honoring classic <laughs> cinema with electrocuting it with energy, this Russian nesting doll of a film begins after a prologue on how to take a bath with the crew of a doomed submarine chewing flapjacks in a desperate attempt to breathe the oxygen within. Suddenly, impossibly, a lost woodsman wanders into their company and tells his tale of escaping from a fearsome clan of cave dwellers. I have no idea what the hell that means, but it's guy <laughs> madness, so I want to see it. All right. The Peanuts movie is being released, Matt. And there's mm -hmm. a 3D version, a regular Blu-ray version, and then one comes with a, a plush Snoopy doll. Did you see oh. the Peanuts movie for the kid? I did. She enjoyed it. It was all right. It was okay. Okay. So that's coming out. She can pick that up for her. I'm sure she'll be very excited. <laughs> the non-blockbuster Ron Howard film, In the Heart of the Sea, coming with a 3D version as well as a traditional Blu-ray. This is the film about the event that inspired the writing of Moby Dick. Um, I don't know what I, there's just, I can't think of a film last year that I was less excited to see than In the Heart of the Sea. And they kept pushing, I'm like, I swear to God, almost every time I went to the theaters, there was a trailer for In the Heart of the Sea for like the entire year. And yet I still was <laughs> able to avoid watching it. Uh, Harry Potter and Professor Xavier starring Victor Frankenstein from Blu-ray DVD Ultraviolet. This is a new take on the Frankenstein mythos. Includes some deleted scenes that are exclusive to the Blu-ray. So you may want to check that out. I got that's another one. I'm not really interested in seeing that film. I doubt you're missing much. 
New to Blu-ray, Criterion is giving us Paris Belongs to Us, um, one of the films that started the French New Wave by Jacques Rivet. Uh, includes a new 2K digital restoration interview with Richard Newper, author of A History of the French New Wave Cinema, some other features as well, and they have brand new English subtitle translations for the film. Here's one you've been waiting for. Are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. Howard the Duck, getting released on Blu-ray. Wow. With duck boobs, hopefully. <laughs> We were in high definite. Yes. And of course, unfortunately, you cut out through that entire joke. So. Oh, I did? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He was talking about the duck boobs and high def. Yeah. You know, that's the way you, that's the way duck boobs were meant to be seen in 1080p. <laughs> so you can see all the feathers. That's right. <laughs> and batteries not included is being released on Blu-ray for the first time. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah, I remember that one. Okay. And then finally, the one I'm excited about. Xanadu with Olivia Newton-John getting its release on Blu-ray. Oh, wow. I'm telling you, <laughs> still one of my favorite songs is from that soundtrack, and it's, it's called Magic. Download it today. You will not be disappointed. You might be, but I don't think you should. <laughs> now, straight to DVD pick of the week. We don't usually get risque with these. Usually there's something horrible, but right off the bat with the title of it is really disturbing. So, and we've talked, what's, what's, this is, I think, our first repeat straight to DVD pick of the week, though. This is from a director we've talked about before on this show, whose name is Bill Zabub. And Bill's back. <laughs> he, he combines the sorrow of Frankenstein with several other elements that have never been mixed before in his penultimate work of absurdism, a category of which he has become the king. Aaron Brown stars in her most ex exploitational role but there are other actresses who will go beyond those boundaries, bewildering the viewer in a barrage of flesh, science, and art. All to support the film called Dick Shark. <laughs> uh, if that you're sounds a, fair. That's sublime. That is, that is true art right there. Do not, do not play this out loud. Do not Google this <laughs> film title when you're at work or in public. But the cover of the DVD basically has a, a, there's a woman next to this guy's area, and out of his pants is a, a penis, but it's got a shark head. <laughs> so wait, I don't understand. Is, is, is the dick shark attached, attached to somebody? He's got like a shark for a dick, or is it like yes. swimming around, or is it like no. a carnivorous, oh, okay. No, I was kind of actually hoping for the latter, that it was a carnivorous dick swimming around in the ocean. Eating no. People. It's attached to a dude. Maybe uh, that's okay. what ends up. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, so maybe we shouldn't talk anymore about it. <laughs> well, it's speculation. It's not spoilers. <laughs> it's true. So your streaming pick of the week, I just finished watching um, Making a Murder, mm. and I thought it was interesting. I did some more research on it afterwards. I was reading up on some other stuff, too. I got to tell you, I don't know if he's innocent. <laughs> I know okay. a lot of people do, but some of the stuff I've read, I'm not confident. No. But if you like that film, my recommendation for you is on Netflix right now. It's Earl Morris's The Thin Blue Line. If you mm, haven't seen classic. it, it is one of the best documentaries, especially true crime documentaries mm -hmm. ever made. And that one made a difference. Mm, so it did. if you haven't seen it, you have to check it out. And it's The Thin Blue Line. All right, Matt. So you ready? Time to, to get loose? Yes. <laughs> Everybody, let's hear a clip from Footloose and now. <laughs> Cut loose. He's a big city kid living in a small town. A lot of folks are going to give you problems right off. He's going to wake him up. Is there a law against loud music? Shake him up. Ren McCormick made a lot of people stop and think. And turn him around. Let's dance! Let's Paramount Pictures presents Kevin Bacon, Laurie Singer. Starts Friday, February 17th at Selected Theaters. Matt, foot loose, 1984. Man, there's so <laughs> I had so <laughs> many thoughts watching this film that I just okay. First off, Kevin Bacon. I don't remember him being this cool when I was watching it, but he was like the coolest <laughs> kid in the planet in this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as the kids would say, he is on fleek. I think is is what the term is. Is that what it is? It is. I think that's what the kids say today, yeah, is on fleek. So uh, if you're not familiar with the story of Footloose, it's a great little film from 2011. 
starring no no so the original 1984 film kevin bacon he moves to a small town in oklahoma and it's a very religious town and they had a really tragic accident so they've outlawed the enjoyment of rock music there's no dancing none of that stuff and he's the, he's the young kid who's coming to town and he's rebelling trying to show the people here listen you know what god's on board man he wants you to dance everybody should have a good time and let's just be kids and drive tractors into each other and get in fights and do weird homoerotic things in the men's room and the shower. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on here. And then let's also have a side plot with a woman who's beaten by her boyfriend, but not really get into that at all. Maybe just <laughs> bring it up again at the end. And the fact that the, the new girlfriend is possibly certifiably crazy and does some really <laughs> disturbing things. Um, I think there's points as well that John Lithgow, who plays the father preacher, I think he has a few points that maybe should be listened to. Uh, mm. I like the fact I enjoyed seeing Chris Penn, rest in peace, um, mm. really uh, shake his action uh, as well. So I don't know where to start, Matt. Um, why don't you t share your thoughts with Footloose? Did it hold up for you? Uh, That's the whole point of this. Well, story. here's the thing. So here's I have a confession to make. I had never actually seen Footloose. What? Uh, so this is this is this is new to me. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was an experience. It was an experience in in uh, in uh, an eighties cinema. I had to if I had a stream of consciousness notes right now, it would be I would say. 80s dancing, but not just 80s dancing, 80s white people dancing, which was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> a lot oh, of this. Oklahoma. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, you would figure that some of these people would have been professionally trained dancers, mm -hmm. or they would have had a professional choreographer to do some of this stuff. Um, he's weird, like really engaging, uh, you know, really kind of guy like you want to hang out with to where he was completely blank, like a Terminator. Like he'd be just thousand yard stare. Like, I don't know what he was doing if this was like his first movie or something. And he just didn't know what to do with himself. Um, I also did like the, uh, the domestic abuse in the middle of it. That like, is not a big deal to anyone. Like, you know, <clears throat> John Lithgow smacking the girl around, then she gets the crap beat out of her by her boyfriend, and and Kevin Bacon's entire reaction is to kind of like, like here, let me look at it and smirk at her while she's got like a huge black eye and a bloody nose. <laughs> I did not understand that at all. Why is everybody okay with this? That's what I mean. Like nobody. I mean, is the is the answer to that is it? It's it's Oklahoma as well. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, it was very it was very odd that nobody could give her across this adult beat up this team <laughs> um yeah so that was that was interesting and then just of course you know me being um me being disgusting and pervy i was i was like man i i forgot how standards of beauty were a lot different in the 80s because everybody's like super skinny like you know they're like basically like like you know all the women are like boys it was weird mm -hmm. other than that you know but yeah, it was it was good. Oh, and, and I'm sorry. One last thing. Please. I was actually very surprised with uh, you know having never seen this movie that Kevin Bacon's famous angry dance in the empty warehouse was not to Footloose. The video believed me to believe that that was to Footloose, and it was not. It was some song that I had never even heard of before. Ah, yeah, no, that's yeah, that's yeah. interesting. The so yeah. I think the soundtrack still really holds up, but um, the soundtrack is great. Yeah, there's. I mean, I recognize. I was like, oh yeah, that 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 yeah. The soundtrack was good. Another really funny scene I thought too is when Lori Singer shows up. They're all at the drive-in eatery place, whatever the hell it is, and she puts her music on, and everybody in the whole area <laughs> should be able to hear it from like a mile away. Right? Like, that is one powerful boombox. Yeah, it is. It's not only that, but they and they all everybody universally loves it so much that they all have to start up dancing where they are. Mm -hmm. And can I say too? Go ahead. Oh, I was just my favorite was the guy dancing while he was playing Galaga or something. That was <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I like to at the end when they finally have the big dance, spoiler, um, how everybody seems to be a really good accomplished dancer, though none of them have danced at all in their entire lives. Like, Grant, you're right, it's white people dancing, but still, they're dancing. That's you, I would true. expect a town full of Chris Pence, you would think, <laughs> but I, 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 I guess not. So nope. another thing, too, what really put me, I don't know if, I, I wrote down a note that says, is this homoerotic or am I homophobic? There was that scene when they were in the shower and the at the you know in the gym afterwards, right. I guess. Right. There's a couple real gratuitous butt shots, and then one scene when a guy turns around and starts walking. I'm like, whoa, whoa. Like I was like, are we gonna see some front? And then, then I was like, I said, you know what though? It's it's 
it's good for the goose, right? I mean, how many in those eighties movies did you see women, these young girls would be topless in those eighties films? It was like, like, like look at that, right? Which I think we talked about last weekend. Um, uh, it, all those kind of films were, it's, it's a good 20 minutes was, was devoted to women being nude. Um, mm. And this, this is the reverse of that. There's no female nudity at all in this film. A whole bunch of butt shots of guys. Uh, so I guess it's turnabout is fair play. So good for them. But it was just, was just off putting at one point. I just didn't, wasn't expecting it. I don't know why. Especially because you know why I think so too is because I know the P, the film's PG. I think I just right. wasn't, exp and I, I read that earlier before I started watching. I'm like, oh, what is this rated? Because I heard an S bomb at one point too, and I was wondering how far it was going to go because I can't remember. I haven't seen the movie since I was a kid. Right. And then, so I think that's what it was. I was taken aback by the nudity because it was PG. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, maybe, and I don't know if you were taken aback. I mean, I think one of the reasons that I was taken aback by it is not because of the nudity per se, but just. It just the kind of weirdness that a bunch of high school dudes would be standing around talking to each other just naked. Like, <laughs> I don't think that you you never see that in movies before. And I don't know about your high school, but you know, a nobody took showers, and even if they did, nobody was standing around while like with their dong hanging out, just hanging out. You know, <laughs> yes. like that was the that was the weird thing. It's like literally guys sitting there but naked and Kevin Bacon's just sitting there having a conversation while naked Chris Penn is sitting there behind him. <laughs> it's just, I think that's really what was off putting about it. It's like this, this doesn't happen anymore. Right. <laughs> I, think that's, I think you're entirely right. I think that's what it must've been. Yeah. Cause I remember in the gym class, I never showered. And the first thing I did was bolt right out of there as soon as I possibly could. Yeah. I think it's more because I had, you know, body shaming issues, but yeah, no, I don't know. It's so Compared to some of the other films we've seen, and you have a comfortable cushion of 80s knowledge. Oh, yeah. Did you enjoy the film? I mean, really, what did you think? Yeah, yeah. Um, I really did enjoy this film, um, believe it or not. I had never seen it before, um, so I, but I was entertained by it the, whole, the entire time. Yeah, I think it still holds up for me, too. Um, it's good to see Sarah Jessica Parker get some work. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. I enjoyed it. I did have a couple of things that, like you said, that are, scream 80s it's things you're just never going to see anymore not just the the casual response to the domestic abuse but um <laughs> just i don't know bacon's great in this he really is he is the epitome of cool in this film and uh like rudy in monster squad and uh i don't know it's it's just it's it's like if you were to when you just when you if you had to pick an 80s film to show aliens that come down to Earth, this would get, this would be in the crop. This would be mm. in the hopper. You know, this is definitely the ones you'd, you'd recommend. So the music's great at it. The kids, everybody seems to be having a good time. I don't know. I, for me, it did hold up. I really, I really enjoyed it. I, I was glad that we were able to revisit it. I got to admit, I was going back and forth on it too. I was like, oh, I don't know if I really want to watch Footloose. <laughs> is it really going to be good? It still was. Yeah. I agree with that assessment. I mean, I was, I mean, even for all the cheesy things, I mean, I laughed at some of the cheesy stuff, but at the end of the day, I still had a good time watching it. You know, yeah. so I think it holds up. There you go. That's my last note. What I wrote it still works. And that's really, <laughs> I guess, all that matters. I think it does a transcend. I think because the message of the film, everything to it is still valid. You know, it's not, it's set in the eighties, but it, it didn't really, f the, the whole core conceit of the film, the whole thing doesn't feel dated. So I think that's why it still works today. Mm -hmm. If you're following along and you watch Footloose with us, why don't you shoot us an email, feedback at thefirstrun.com, or just watch it later and uh, just let us know. Just tweet us up a storm. Uh, Matt, let's do it. Let's do get it. into the top five critic audience disagreements or the uh, however else I call it. That's what I love. When I do this stuff, I always have three or four different versions <laughs> of what I'm going to call it. Uh, so... Yeah, so I also called it, what is it, the top five cinema score disconnects. I like that. I may stick mm -hmm. with that as the final title. So Sounds good to me. I have five. I have a total of 11, uh, you know, including honorable mentions, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't you, you know what? Yeah, why don't you start it off this week, and that way I get the final number one. Because my final number one, uh, I'm probably, uh, it, it's not going to be pretty. So go ahead. Why don't you start off? <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have the same number one. So we'll, this will, this will work well for us. Okay. Our, um, all right. So my number five, um, now the disconnect wasn't as huge as some of the other ones on this list um, where the audience gave it a B minus critics gave it a 93%. And I think 
this is one of the one of our favorite films here on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a lot of respect for it. Is is uh, Children of Men, um, which mm-hmm. is a fantastic film, and I don't understand why people don't like it. I mean, it's it's got great action. It's filmed brilliantly. The the you know the performances are great. The story is good. I mean, I don't see what's not to like about it. Um, so I was actually a little surprised that I got a B minus. Yeah, it's on my honorable mentions list too, um, because I thought the fact that it was a B minus, but still in yeah. the B category, that it didn't quite was not not much of a a, a difference for me. But yeah, I think when I saw Children of Man, man, I was you know when I went to go see it, I think I was I was killing some time, and I had to kill a few hours, so I said, oh, I'll go check out this film. Because I didn't, there's something about it just didn't appeal to me. There's something about it I didn't really, you know. Right. And I thought that thing blew me away. I instantly became a, a fan of the director, Alfonso Cuaron. It's got one of the greatest action tracking shots in a film you will ever see. And it's one of the better sci fi films of the past 15, 20 years, hands mm-hmm. down. So if you haven't seen Children of Men, I'm telling you, buy it today. It's that good. You will mm-hmm. not be disappointed. Yeah, that's a weird one. My number five is funny. We brought up Dave this week. Is Dave's favorite film of all time? Wow! With a C minus cinema score, a Rotten Tomato score of eighty percent, and my favorite Wes Anderson film as well, and that's The Royal Tannenbaums. C minus on that film, and I feel like it's that's like for me the pinnacle of Wes Anderson's work is mm-hmm. Tannenbaums. It is a brilliant film. I can't understand how somebody can walk in. The only way I can cut some slack on it is that his films are not big box office, right? They're just not. Let's right. all be honest. He, he does have a right. bit of a niche audience. So that's the only thing I can think of. Because I bet you if I, I did, this is the only one I looked at. If I bet you I've looked at all his other films, I wouldn't be surprised if they're all like that. Maybe not Fantastic Mr. Fox, but I don't know. But anyway, that one really bothered me. C minus for Tana. Yeah, I'm with you. That was actually my number four. Um, and I, I and the only thing I would add to that is again, it's it's my favorite uh, of the um, Anderson films. But it's not like it's his first one. So he had had several out there. So you should have had an idea of what you were getting going into the film. Um, so you would have thought that the audience would have been through it. I mean, he's definitely had some weak ones. I would be curious to kind of see where some of the weak ones, like Darjeeling Limited, landed out. Um, but yeah, it would. Uh, it's 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 an absolutely fantastic film. It's still my favorite of his. He's got a, some these late ones like Grand Budapest and Moonrise Kingdom have been really good. But um, it's still it's still the best one for me. Yeah. So, all right. So my number four then is the film that basically exploded P.T. Anderson, uh, mm-hmm. and that's Boogie Nights. Ninety-two percent Rotten Tomatoes. A fantastic film. A C on the Cinema Score. A C Matt. This is a classic American film, Boogie Nights. Mm-hmm. I, re- I, I, I have no reservation saying that. I really think it is. It's what made Mark Wahlberg a boxable star, right? And, uh, and it'll forever have given us Roller Girl. So um, it, it, nom- it got Brute Reynolds an Academy Award nomination. Did he win that too that year? I don't even remember. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if he did. I don't, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. But he did get a nomination. So uh, it's a brilliant film, kind of a takeoff on the, uh, not a takeoff, but a, a dramatization of the life of, oh, uh, crap, what's the guy's name now? John Holmes. John Holmes, thank you. I was going with Peter North. Not that I know who that is. So <laughs> Boogie Nights, I'm telling you, it, it, it depicts the 70s and that whole L.A. coke-fueled porn business thing so vibrantly and, and really – how about Philip Seymour Hoffman in that film? Too? That was my first real exposure to P.S. Hoffman, who was absolutely heartbreakingly brilliant in that film. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, strong performances across the board. My first real exposure to John C. Riley. I mean, mm-hmm. I, there's so much in this film. I'm telling you, Boogie Nights is a cl- it's an American classic. And C by the audience, who clearly don't know what they're talking about. Clearly do not. I'm amazed. All right, so this one's going to be a contentious, uh, contentious pick for for us because I I liked it, I think a hell of a lot better than everybody else did, and I think that's because of another version of this film that was out before. Um, but I picked for my number three, um, Let Me In, which is the re I'm not going to call it, <laughs> but it's a it's another the American adaption of the. Uh, uh, Let the Right One In uh, vampire story with uh, Chloe Grace Moretz and um, Cody Smith-McPhee. Is that who it is? Yep. Yeah. Um, 
got a C plus in the audience score. Uh, critics graded it as an 80%. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I understand that um, the scenes are definitely um, a lot of the scenes are the same as far as the the Swedish uh, adaption of it goes. But to me, the the acting and just the storyline it's very different and it's a lot more personal. Um, whereas you know the other the Swedish version is very you know chilly and kind of cold whereas this is kind of much more intimate um and i really enjoyed it i think it's i think both films stand really well on their own um the, the american version of this yeah i like the original better and i think i would have liked the american version better if i hadn't seen the original one mm -hmm. i think the original one is, is a is a far superior film but it's still i think the u.s version is is pretty good yeah but not enough for me to for it to add to my list my number three than Matt is I'm going backwards. All right, okay. these is a, is a group of films that I cannot stand. They have horrible Rotten Tomato scores, and there's there's four of them. So I think you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> the first film got an A cinema score. The second film an A. The third a B plus, and the most recent one an A minus. What franchise am I talking about, Matt? What do you think? Uh, what? I don't know. I'm I'm drawing a blank here. There's so many. It could be. Transformers, A. Oh, Dark yes. of the Moon, A. Revenge of the Fallen, B plus. Extinction, A minus. Let me tell you something. These films are trash. <laughs> they are horrible. They're nigh unwatchable. All mm -hmm. right. The first one I thought was okay, <clears throat> and if I graded, I'd give it like a C plus. And the rest of them have been Fs for me down the line. Progressively mm -hmm. worse as they've come <laughs> out. So I, I appreciate that Extinction didn't have the racism that the one previous to it did. So good on you, Mike. But still, it's this is just a, a horrible, horrible, just abortions of films. They're 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 unwatchable, and I don't understand yeah. how people can go into these things and love them. The problem too is I like mindless action films. You give me Jason Statham any day of the week, odds are I'm going to watch it. But I'm telling you, the problem with these movies is half the time, you can't follow what the hell is happening. Mm -hmm. The action scenes are so frantic and kinetic. You can, and I think they make, the, they, they make the robots so needlessly complicated that you can't follow what's happening half the time. And I just, they're just horrible. They're horrible films, and they make me angry. Uh, and they keep making them. So I don't know. And I think they're the, the line reason why we have Shia LaBeouf. So thank you. <laughs> so that's my three, the Transformers films God. in air quotes. Yeah. I now see I was fortunate enough. I have not seen the la the later version. I saw the first two. I saw the first one, I blind bought it, and I was like, ooh, ooh, this is a bad idea. Cause I've never <laughs> I didn't actually go out and see it. And then I think we went and watched it for the show, which I'll I'll never forgive you for. So the second one. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I refuse to watch it anymore and I refuse to even support them in any way possible. But they're absolutely a terrible films. I can't. I tell you, whenever nope. I think about that part two with with Megan Fox work, fixing her motorcycle, right? But she's leaning over the motorcycle to get to the part just so her body's spread out across it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so incredibly stupid. I just. <laughs> Oh, Even dumber than the uh, than the wrecking ball uh, testicles on the, on the uh, giant robot. <laughs> God, I forgot about that. Oh God, that's so bad. All right, let's, <laughs> let's, let's move on. I'm getting nauseous. All right, I'm sorry. My number two was your number four, Boogie Nights. Um, fantastic, classic film. Um, I won't belabor the point. I think everything you said was spot on. But I will say that I think the the finest moment, in, maybe in cinema history, <laughs> is when Mark Wahlberg is singing You Got the Touch from the animated Transformers film, which That's was fantastic. <laughs> I had that as my ringtone at one point. <laughs> you got touch. That is a, oh, that is great. <laughs> <laughs> I got to watch that again. All right. My number two is one of the greatest films of the past 10 years. My number two, Matt, is a film I watch at least once a year. Interesting. If, if you're going with, I would have, if you're going with what you're going, what I think you're going with, I would have expected that to be number one. No, because my it. number one is more insulting. Okay. My number two is Drive. Mm. 
C minus cinema score. C minus. It's not mm -hmm. Valhalla Rising. It's not Only God Forgives. It is a much more straightforward, accessible film than either of those movies. But Drive is a modern film noir set in modern times that basically takes place in 1985. But I'm telling you, man, this thing is a work of art. It's one of my all-time favorite films. And I can't, the best picture that year when it came out, even though it didn't get the recognition it should have, it was an arts art, you know, it was a critic's favorite. But still, I'm telling you, man, Drive is a, just a brilliant, beautiful, violent, disturbing, but poetic film. I can't, I don't have enough superlatives, Matt, I don't. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people watched that movie and gave it a C minus, I don't under, I just don't, I feel like sometimes I just don't understand my fellow man. <laughs> I don't understand. No, it was my number one. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic film. I think so. The, I think the problem with Drive is that it shot itself in the foot because the previews and the commercials. When I saw them, not knowing really anything about the film, um, was I thought this was going to be a Fast and Furious clone. So I had absolutely no interest in seeing it. And I'm thinking that probably the people that went and saw it were expecting the same thing. But there's actually barely any drive so um no i don't even it's car chases are very brief the few that are there um so i guess if that's what you went and looking for it would completely ruin you but i, I kind of again I, I weep for the the common man or my fellow man just because uh you couldn't get past that for something that's so good exactly which i think perfectly segues us to our number one i think one of the criminally poorly marketed films of the past 10 years along with drive matt this film has an F on a cinema score, right? An F. I you can't ex you. I don't understand that. I cannot understand it. You have an F cinema score film starring Brad Pitt. Are mm. you kidding me? Clearly, I'm going with Killing Them Softly, one mm. of the best films as well, along with Drive of the past ten years. I, I don't. I think that it's exactly the same problem. Is that the advertising stuff, like, oh wow, this is like a, it's like a mob movie starring Brad Pitt. It's gonna be like Goodfellas meets The Godfather, or with a bunch of action and stuff. When I mean, Brad Pitt's holding a shotgun on the damn poster, right? Uh, but and it's not that's not what the film is at all. And I think that's what where people fell down. It's where they got confused. If you walk into this film and watch it for what it is, a dark tale about the financial recession how it impacts everybody even criminals and this and then uh, gandolfini in one of his final roles too is absolutely brilliant in this film he, it's almost like an aside side story but it's 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 important and i think it's just one of the brilliant things to do too with this film is it's framed throughout right by um the 2008 election so you have um, snippets and speeches of by Obama and McCain, and McCain kind of playing through certain – every time they're in a bar or there's something on the radio, they're talking about the recession. And just kind of just then just, just dressing the film in that type of cloth and that patina, having it on there really adds to the, just, just to the emotional depth of the film. It's a, it's a brilliant movie. It really is. And I don't – it kills me that this thing did not get the recognition it should. I really, this could have been a Best Picture nominee. I really think so. And it is aged exceptionally well. I watched it again like a month ago, and it's still absolutely, it's better. I mean, it, it's one of those, it, it's just, a, it's a brilliant film. If you haven't seen it, watch it in the right mindset. You have Scoot McNary, who supposedly is going to have a huge year this year. He's supposed to be in a bunch of great stuff. Ben Mendelsohn, if you've seen him too, he's always fantastic in everything he does. Richard Jenkins, you know, Ray Liotta, Gandolfini, Brad Pitt. It's, it's a brilliant film, and it kills me that people either have hated it, F, Matt, F, or they just didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, that is a, actually, that is a really good film. Yeah, I think it, it suffered the same thing as Drive, but I mean, it's it's actually, it, you know, it's kind of got all that noirish intrigue kind of thing going on it. But I mean, and just some of the the kind of arts artness to the the kind of extreme violence. Um, it's not like going into it, you didn't get some of what you were looking for, right? It was still violent, you know, there was still kind of the criminal intrigue, but there was a lot more depth to it. So it's not like you didn't get what you were looking for in the first place. So 
you know, you can't get over the fact that it made you think a little bit or made your brain hurt um, while you were watching it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. Disappointing. Yeah. So anyway, do you have any honorable mentions? Yeah, so I tried to do the opposite for my honorable mentions where okay. the critics hated it, but the audience loved it. But I had a really hard time finding anything that I would agree with. Um, the only things I could come up with, which are even very minimal on my okay. end, were... Well, Super Troopers and Grandma's Boy, uh, they're funnier. I mean, Super Troopers grows on you. I didn't really even actually like it when I first watched it. But uh, Grandma's Boy, I actually thought was good, stupid fun. And the critics absolutely hated it. So I would recommend seeing that if you want to see something dumb and funny. Fair enough. Yeah, I also had High Fidelity, C+. Uh, the film that inspired this list, The Witch, C-. Minus. Mm -hmm. You talk about Children of Men, Pulp Fiction, B+. Plus. B+, plus, people. Uh, Blair Witch, C+. Plus. And then finally, Cabin in the Woods, C. Mm. I mean, I like Cabin in the Woods. Me too. Those are my honorable mentions, Matt. Next week, we're not going to be here next week. Uh, I'm taking the week off because I'm getting married and I'm not going to be around. The week after that, though, we'll be back. Matt, are you going to be able to go see 10 Cloverfield Lane? Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'll, yes. Yes. All right. So we'll see 10 Cloverfield Lane. I don't know what we're going to do for the marathon. Um, we're trying to figure it out if that's going to be our 300th episode or if we're going to cheat, make it up to 299.5, and then have Batman for Superman be our 300th. Who knows? Oh, maybe we'll just skip it for two weeks. Who cares? Nobody's listening. Right? Shoot me an email. Be back at the first run. <laughs> com. Tell me if you're listening. And uh, that's the big show for this week. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter, uh, YouTube. Just do a search for the first run. We'll come right up. Uh, and that's going to be the big show for this week, Matt. Uh, I'm going to take an extended break, and we will see you in a couple weeks. All right. Mazel tov. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>